Good evening, everybody. Um, I don't know whether it's midsummer or midwinter at the minute. Um, I don't know how you feel, but I think I could do with some sunshine. Um, my name is Clive Holland. Uh, I am the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of the Highlands and Islands. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here this evening to the University of the Highlands and Islands at Perth College uh, and to the inaugural professorial lecture of Professor Andrew Ray our newly appointed Professor of Engineering. Each academic partner in the university has, as well as the usual subjects you would expect to find in a university, specialist subjects that, serve, that exist to serve the needs of the community in which it serves. As well as providing an innovative student experience that is relevant to key industry sectors, serving the needs of our community, also involves having a strong focus on existing and potential industry needs so that we can work with them to provide the skills and the innovation necessary to help our communities thrive. For some of our partners, that specialism is creative arts, marine science, renewable energy, or music, to name just a few. Here at Perth College, we have a number of such specialisms. But tonight, we are here to focus on engineering, particularly engineering and in transport or air transport operations. We also carry out research and experimental and applied aerodynamics. And we hope we are at the forefront of innovative research in this field. I'm sure that you are already aware that 69% of our research was rated as internationally excellent or world leading. A statistic we are very proud of. Indeed, it put the university on the global map alongside many other top rated universities in terms of research. What these results show is that not only are we dedicated to what we do, but as a university of our region and our community, we are truly aware of the key areas that not only matter to our region, but will have an impact on the people and the organizations that live and thrive here. In our strategic plan, we state that our research excellence will be based on the natural environment culture, the industries, and the social infrastructure of the highlands and islands. In that respect, we are dedicated to working with various industry sectors to continue to provide research and innovation in areas that matter to them and to this region. In appointing our new professor of engineering to a chair of experimental and applied aerodynamics, we are aiming to deliver on that commitment from our strategic plan. Professor Andrew Ray graduated from Imperial College in 1987 and joined the high lift section of the aerodynamics department at the Royal Aircraft Establishment in Farnborough. His activities there concentrated on the physics of multi-element aerofoils, largely but not exclusively for civil aircraft, including Reynolds number effects and wake vorticity. Whilst based at the pressurized wind tunnel at Farnborough, he was involved in the development and application of wind tunnel corrections and test techniques. He has worked on projects for Airbus, Boeing, and several Formula One teams. He was deputy chairman of the Technical and Scientific Board of the European Wind Tunnel Association. And within this framework was the focus for wind tunnel correction and advanced simulation methodologies. He was the signatory for the aerodynamics clearance of flight test aircraft, including the Canberra, Andover, Nimrod, Hercules, Jaguar, Tornado, Sea King, Chinook, and Lynx. And he has also worked on many non-aeronautical applications, 
including road and rail transport, wind engineering, and sport. Quite a pedigree indeed. His current research focuses on hydrogen-powered aircraft design, wind tunnel test techniques, including noise measurement and pressure-sensitive paint. He also is involved in research on motorsport aerodynamics, including current work for the Sahara Force India Formula One team. His principal role as professor of engineering, based here at Perth, will be to develop the university's portfolio of engineering research. And I am delighted to introduce him here this evening to present his inaugural professorial lecture. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I present Professor Andrew. Um, thank you, Clive, for that introduction. Um, it must be strange having to read words you don't actually understand. Um, I'll test it on them later. <laughs> um, I better find my presentation now. <clears throat> so thank you all for coming this evening. Um, when I was asked to do this presentation, um, I contemplated the subject on which to do it. I thought it would be a nice idea to entertain yourselves and hopefully to entertain myself as well and have a good time while we're here. Um, I thought I'd regale you with some funny stories, but I couldn't think of any funny stories that I hadn't already heard. So I'll have to talk to you about another passion of mine beyond my family and education, which is aeroplanes and racing cars. I have to say at this point that I don't like Formula One, but I'm going to talk about Formula One cars. There's a difference. Cars are interesting. The racing, in my opinion, is not. They're not controversial. But here we go. So, a few things to talk about this evening. Start with a brief overview of engineering within the university. Something we set up here at Perth College called the Centre for Advanced Engineering. Give you a bit more of the background that Clive alluded to earlier on, and then talk to you about some aerodynamics applied to. Uh, aeroplanes and Formula One cars. We're going to start with engineering at UHI. UHI comprises of 13 partners, colleges and research institutes, of which five undertake engineering, um, the two largest being UNS and Perth. But we also have engineering applications at Goose Castle, at North Highland College, at Shetland, and at Argyle. Vast range of applications I'm on the land, at sea, and my own specialism in the air. One of our unique aspects is the range of education which we provide tertiary education and further education through the postgraduate and technician through the doctoral studies. Um, just an indication there of some of the technologies that we cover. Postgraduate, uh, sorry, undergraduate level, we have a lot of um, engineering degree courses, some of which are listed there. And in the last year or two, we've introduced some master's programmes with the help of folk here at Perth in air transport operations and MBA in management for aviation. Locally, with the help of the senior management team here, who have given me an effort to hang myself by, we've set up. Um, Centre for Advanced Engineering, which is a collection of research staff, computational facilities, and experimental facilities that are now participating in international standards research. And that's the culmination of a four year journey from um, undergraduate programmes through to postgraduate and research programmes. The Centre for Advanced Engineering encompasses something we call the Dunn Aeronautical Laboratory down the campus towards the Goodley Burn building, and it contains a lot of aeronautical facilities there. We have an aeroplane, we have a fantastic flight simulator, 
We will have two wind channels, we only have one at the moment, one is on its way. We have a gas turbine rig and we have some rapid prototyping capability, 3D printer and 3D routing machine. The reason we call it the Dunn Aeronautical Laboratory is after John William Dunn, who was a scientist at Farnborough, which is where I first came across him. But he came up with these delta wing biplanes in 1907. So this was not long after the Wright Buzzard had first flown. Uh, they were considered so secret that they were trained all the way up from the south of England to Blair Athol, and the flight tests were conducted on the Blair Athol estate. His work has led indirectly to the modern B2 stealth bomber, where he was the first person to look at swept wing tailless aircraft. But if you ask people outside of Farnborough, no one's ever heard of it, so I'm trying my best to address that. Just a brief run through some of the research work we're doing within the Centre for Arctic Engineering. Um, the thing I'm most happy doing is wind tunnel testing. And as Clive mentioned, we're working for the Sahara Force India Formula One team. On the left hand side here, we have some flow visualization, which is colored to paint, painted onto a wing. We blow air over it and see where it goes. And from that, we can deduce how well the wing is performing. We've come up with some techniques to help Force India improve what they do and get more information out of their testing. That same technique is now evaluated by Airbus and by Boeing. Someone trying to shoot me there. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that tall ring already, is it? <laughs> um, and we're currently working with BAE systems to develop pressure sensitive paint again, as Clive mentioned, which is paint which changes colour depending on the pressure of air it is being subjected to. It's quite clever stuff. Um, it's quite difficult to apply, and there are places where you can't do it at the moment. Our intention is to extend the capabilities of that paint so we can use it on, for example, the front wing of a Formula One car, rear wing of a Formula One car, and the high lift systems of an airliner. Associated with that is our former student team, which is the first team within UHI to be um, started upon. After three years, we've come up with a really quite useful design. Um, and we've done it in a different way. Normally it's the master's level students in undergraduate programs that do it. We've taken advantage of our particular nature by introducing people on vocational courses from across the curriculum. We've got aeronautical students, automotive students, uh, people from construction, building technology, uh, creative industry and computing. So it's a team like no other in the country as far as I'm aware, incorporating all those different disciplines and all those different um, and as a result of that, it's a lot more fun. Uh, hopefully by next year, we'll have a car that we can run around the, uh, the car park. And I'll tell you what it is, so you don't park your car there. <laughs> Just an example of some other stuff we're up to at the moment. Wind turbine blade design. Um, I've heard wind turbine design described as agricultural. Um, there's regular aerospace technology goes into a wind turbine. We're hoping to address that. Um, one, thing in particular is if you have a series of devices, one behind the other, how does the one in front affect the one behind? If turbulence created by an upstream wind turbine will affect the performance of the downstream one. Just a little there. I mentioned the flight traffic, the definitely management flight simulation stuff we're doing. Uh, a couple of guys here, Pete and Callum, have been working very hard on the flight simulator. And it really is a fantastic facility. Um, it's being reworked at the moment, and it'll be even better once they're finished. Um, you can all come along five or couple ago when it's finished. If you can get me out of it, that is. <laughs> and something called No Fault Found, which is a curious title, but it refers to um, a problem reported by a pilot, or it can be in any industry, telecommunications, for example. When engineers go to find the problem, it's not there. What do you do? If it's a safety issue, do you replace the part? Do you look for it to fix it? Um, if you replace it, you might be replacing something that isn't actually broken just costed money for no real reason. So it's cost the aerospace industry and telecommunications and oil and gas lots and lots of money to replace things that don't need replacing. So we were part of a project at this Cranfield University looking at the, the symptoms of no fault found and how you deal with them. The sounds of the back lane has been having an empty eye with, um, no, uh, with uh, combustion noise. <laughs> static electricity, which one do? Um, 
Half the noise that comes out the back of a jet engine, which is a lot less than it used to be, is now due to the fact that we're burning the fuel in the combustion chamber. It's not the jet out the back, it's the noise from the combustion chamber. Because the back end has been made much more quiet, it's now getting to be one of the areas where we can make advances in reducing noise of the engine. So working with Rolls-Royce, University of Surrey, and the University of Oxford, and a company called Division, who do some very clever instrumentation work, we were going to poke some lasers into the combustion chamber of a gas turbine engine when it's running, and no one's ever done that, no one's ever done that before. So, that's what we're up to here. Now a bit about why I got here in the first place. Um, as Clive said, I graduated from Imperial College. In the space of 22 years, I was in the same office but worked for four different companies as the Royal Aircraft Establishment, known as to DRA, Vendera, and Connected. Um, before I left there, I started working as a Royal Engineering Engineering uh, Professor of Engineering Design at Surrey University. Um, and then five years ago, I moved here. I'm currently a member of the Aeronautics Aerodynamic Specialist Group for the Royal Aeronautical Society. Um, external examiner at Cranfield, a visiting professor at Zhongzhou University in China. So it's funny where life takes you. My first job was on something called the T 45, which was the re winging of the Hawk aircraft that the Red Arrows use. I didn't get the Red Arrows in the there you go. <laughs> um, the US Navy to land on their aircraft carriers. The Hawk was never designed to land on an aircraft carrier. When they put all the things on that you need to, which includes the big crochet hook at the back to carry to catch on the wire, and the aircraft became unstable, so they had to redesign the wing. Tornado here um, has rubbish brakes because it's got um, lots of thrust reverse. Unfortunately, the pilots were using the thrust reverse to bucket to the back, take the flow out of the jet engine, and shove it forward. And it acts like a big brake. They were using it too much. And as you can see in this picture here, which is water on the runway being aerosolized by, let's be careful how you say aerosolized in the public <laughs> Um, by the jet, and it's taken, this is the intake here, so any stones that are on the ground are being carried forward and being re-ingested into the engine. Um, jet engines don't like stones going through them, and it was costing a lot of money. And once we worked out which speed this was happening at, we saved the RF 12 million pounds in the first year. This is Typhoon, which had a similar problem, it's got an intake at the bottom, so it was very good at acting like a hoover and catching up lots of stones. Airbus is an interesting company. It's um, basically four companies in one. None of them talk to each other very much. Um, AC40 was the first aircraft I've worked on for Airbus, mainly on the high lift devices, the flaps and slats, which I'll talk a bit more about in, in the near future, and the A380. This is the A380 in the wind tunnel that Clive mentioned. It's called the five meter wind tunnel because from wall to wall, it's five meters wide. So from this wall to this wall is five meters and it's pressurized to three atmospheres. So it's quite a bit. The Boeing, 77 was the first aircraft I saw from Concept 3 at the first flight, so we also have a soft spot for that. This is the 747 in the five meter wind tunnel. And I don't know how many of you will be familiar with that airplane. It's called the Summit Cruiser. There was one airplane I've worked on that I really wish had flown. It looks far too much like a Thunderbirds aircraft for me, but it would have been very, very cool. Now the Concorde sadly no longer exists, that would have been the aircraft that turned into this place. Again, as Clive mentioned, as, as in-service support clearance, I had to make sure that these aircraft were safe to fly once they had been modified. So, as 111, top left, the Andover top right, Nimrod in the middle, another Andover bottom left, there's two Kings on the right. ETPS is the Empire Test Pilot School, which is the school in the UK which teaches all the test pilots that the RAF use and the Navy. It also trains a lot of overseas test pilots and they do very strange things with roll-on little aeroplanes. Um, and it's very interesting to work with them to make sure they don't fall out of the sky. Because we all live within an aeronautical environment, we breathe air, we move around in air, there are lots of other things that need to understand how the air moves. So I was fortunate to work on quite a few different things. Here is Chris Boardman's composite bike, the first composite bike worked on the Lotus. Um, he's an interesting character if you ever get to meet him. It's the thunder of a lightning, I'll be able to see him. Um, to say oh, he's true. Sorry, 
you wouldn't just want to switch your title mic off. I'm not so sure if it's static or whatever. Just use the lens from mic there. I think that's just caused the problem. Let's find out. Level? You still hear me? You still hear me? Yes. No, I think that's still alright. Motorsport, which I'll go on to in more detail later, but I've had the pleasure to work with Toyota, Force India, Williams and Lotus over the last four or five years. And that was my baby, my five metre wind tunnel. As I said, it was five metres from one wall to the other. This thing here, um, I don't know if you can make out, there's a car at the bottom here. Um, there's a chap standing in the middle. That's the A380, that's the 787 Green Liner, and that's the fan at the back. It was a 12 megawatt motor that drove the thing. Um, which would darken most of Perth when you turned it on. One of the reasons I came north was my grandfather. Um, that's him there, and there. He flew for an airline out of Glasgow from 1932 to 1934, moved across to Inverness, uh, and then was based in Kirkpool from 1934 to 1935. Um, flying wood and canvas aeroplanes in a Scottish winter with a stopwatch, stopwatch and a compass, um, beggars belief as far as I'm aware. So there, there are entries in his logbook where taking off involved the ground crew just letting go. The wind was so strong, the ground crew just let go and the aircraft went straight up. So, proper flying. So, that's more than enough about me. I'm going to start with some basic physics. We're going to start nice and easy. <laughs> <laughs> Those, as I'm sure you're all aware, are the neighbour Stokes equations. Um, I will talk about those later, but I don't expect you to understand them. Just to say that these are physical quantities. They look horrendous, but mathematicians have a knack of defining things in a way that we can understand them in a language that we might not often understand. So, on the Navier Stokes equations, we have acceleration, we have pressure, we have viscosity, we have inertia. And I'm going to talk about two of these things here. These are the equations of motion for any fluid. That's a liquid or a gas. In my case, it's air. But if we can solve that equation for a particle of air, we can solve it for every other particle. And we can predict what's going to happen. So, anybody know who that is? Isaac Newton, well done. Scary kind of chap. He had three laws. First of which was an object stays in motion unless acted upon an external force. That's the Voyager satellite, which as far as I know is still going. It's the furthest thing we've ever got beyond our solar systems. Um, unless you believe the Star Trek films, in which case it's going to come back at some point. <laughs> Second law is force equals mass times acceleration. The harder you hit something, the more force you have. The bigger thing you hit it with, the bigger the force you have. Um, I think I may be unique in having Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton and Luigi on the same PowerPoint slide. <laughs> um, I hope I am. And the third law is, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And we use those quite a bit when we're designing aeroplanes. Newton's cradle, which is um, a good way to spend a wet afternoon, playing with the different combinations and permutations. Um, Whatever happens on the right happens on the left. And that also is how a jet engine works. I have one. That's a Trent 900 on the bottom left. Costs approximately 15 million pounds. This is a yellow rubber balloon, which cost a matter of pence. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. <laughs> Air goes that way, balloon goes that way. Same with the jet engine. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is a section through a jet engine. Suck air in the front, we squeeze it in a compressor, we set fire to it with petrol and it goes bang, and we blow it out the back. Air goes that way, jet engine goes that way. 
If we strap an aeroplane to this, aeroplane also goes that way. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. As an aerodynamicist, it does pain me to say that most of the advances in jet aircraft recently have come from jet engines. Not all, but a lot. That's the A380. It has four French 1000 engines on it. That's the Royal Albert Hall. I don't know how many cubic feet of air it has. But the A380 at full power will empty the air out of the Royal Albert Hall in 25 seconds. So you don't want to be standing in the way when it does it. <laughs> Now then, a bit of pressure. You and I are feeling pressure right now. Perhaps me more than you, but we're all feeling pressure. Because there's a column of air above us going out to the edge of the atmosphere, and that has weight. Air weighs about a kilogram per cubic metre. So that much, by that much, by that much, weighs a kilogram. Anybody remember how much water weighs? One kilogram per metre. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> a thousand kilograms. So water weighs a thousand times more than air does, which is why if you go diving, it's more severe than if you go upwards. But it means that we have a significant number of kilometers of air above our head. Um, but if we climb, if we go up, we have less of that column of air above us, so the pressure reduces. We have in our bodies some fantastic pressure transducers. When you go up in a car in a hill and you climb in an aeroplane, your ears will pop because your ears are pressure transducers. Noise, sound, is pressure waves. And so your ears are designed to feel pressure. Pressure is important, though. I'm one of the first people to determine how important was a guy called Daniel Bernoulli, a um, famous mathematician in the early 1700s, one of three brothers, if I remember rightly, and a very famous dad who was also a mathematician. They both entered a competition. Daniel beat his dad to the prize and was locked out of the house for three weeks. <laughs> Proof then, as now, that no one likes a smart ass. <laughs> this is Bernoulli's equation. So... Total pressure is made up of two components, a static component and a dynamic component. The dynamic component depends on how fast the air is going. So that looks quite complicated, but we can break it down. If the air isn't moving, and this number is a constant, then this number has to equal the left hand side. If the air starts to move, the velocity stops being zero, if it becomes a number, then this number will change. So, if the dynamic pressure goes up and this stays constant, what happens to this number? It goes down. It's one in this case. The numbers don't mean anything, it's just to show something. Right, have you all got a piece of paper? Say, yes, Andrew. Yes, yes. Andrew. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> So, how many of you thought you were going to make a paper aeroplane? <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> what I want you to do is to not fold, but bend the paper in half and mark the middle. So what I want you to do is mark the middle. So you get a little crease at the top. You doing it, Gary? Yep. Very good. <laughs> then take one edge and fold it to the middle to the mark you've just made. You've ended up doing that. Do the same on the other side. You end up with that. And each end, I need you to fold back on itself. And you'll end up with a little red piece. <laughs> <laughs> make it easy to do this. You do the same on the other side. So what you end up with is something like the cross section of a store broker. Well, it doesn't do it. 
Right, I think you've all got little tables next to you. You're going to need those because what I want to do next is put it down on the surface and hold the two edges. Okay. So what we've made is a little tunnel. Tables aren't ripped, so you might have to dislocate your shoulders here. What we want to do in a minute is blow through the tunnel. And I want you, before you do it, to see what's going to happen to the top. Is it going to stay where it is? Is it going to lift up? Or is it going to go down? On count three. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> the reason it went down is because the air above the paper is stationary, the air below it is moving. So the air below it has lower static pressure. Lower static pressure above, higher static pressure above, the air falls down. And that is how wings work. Really? What wings do is accelerate air differently above them and below them. So the air going over a wing is faster than the air going underneath. If this is going faster, it has a lower static pressure. If this is going slower, it has a higher static pressure. Low pressure, high pressure, you generate a force, and that force is lift. If we force that lift to be very, very high, the pressure above the wing can be so low that the water in the air condenses out of it. So here on the wing, the A340, the pressure is so low that the water has condensed out. The same on F14, which I'm not to drop out of Top Gun, I think that one must be Maverick coming around the corner. So the air here, the pressure is so low that the water is condensed out into a cloud. So, landing and takeoff, high lift devices. These are the things that I've spent 30 years helping to design. Back in the days of the Red Baron, they had more wings than they knew what to do with, largely for structural reasons. They had so much lift that, as I said with my grandfather, on strong wings a day, all he had to do was let go and the thing would take off like a kite. With more powerful engines, metal fuselages, aircraft got faster. Wings got a bit more simple, and so the high lift devices here, the flip flap at the back, didn't need to be very powerful. For the jet engine, the wing itself was no longer sufficient, and we had to come up with very powerful multi element devices at the back and the front of the wing. This is a 747, same here. You can see it's like a Venetian blind of elements that provide a huge amount of lift. But they're also very heavy. The history of high lift is interesting and it came about by accident. Uh, in about 1911, Sir Frederick Handley Page, the originator of the Handley Page Aircraft Company, was looking at ways to improve the performance of a wing. And he'd read that short, stubby wings, things that were as wide as they were deep, had huge potential. And so he did lots of experiments, cutting slots along the wing. The test results were very disappointing not what he'd imagined. I don't know who did it, or indeed why they did it, but somebody cut the slots along the wing rather than down the wing. The first time they did it, it gave 25% increase in lift. That's a huge amount in aerodynamics terms. Airbus today will fight your arm off for 0.1% improvement in aerodynamics. 25% is huge. With a bit of improvement, they came to 50%. And so the leading edge slot and the trailing edge slot performed. It appears that purely by coincidence, in Germany at the same time, a guy called Gus Lachmann, who was a Prussian cavalry officer, which is why I've drawn that helmet. <laughs> I'm not a Daily Mail reader. Um, uh, wanted to join the Air Force. Um, in his first training flight, it stalled and he crashed and ended up in hospital. 
and he wasn't too enamored with that process, so he tried to improve the performance of the aircraft. So he persuaded a nurse to get him some cigars, some balsa wood, and a fan, and in his hospital bed, he experimented with little wind tunnel models. He came to the same conclusion that Andy Page had done. Unfortunately, unlike Andy Page, he was broke. And Professor Prandtl at Göttingen uh, wanted 50 pounds off him to do the wind tunnel test for approval, so he could get his grant application and fund. So he begged his mother for the money. He thought he was mad, but she gave him the money. And sure enough, he proved the results, filed the patent, and within six weeks of each other, both Andy Page and Nachman, who had never met, filed almost exactly the same patent. So this was First World War time. The principles behind it were not fully understood until 1972. People thought they worked for the wrong reason. A guy called Amos Smith at Douglas Company um, finally worked out how they worked. On a modern airline, you will see things along the leading edge called slats, things along the lead, uh, trailing edge called flaps. And they deploy at landing and takeoff. You've probably seen them when you go on holiday or, or take your flask and your notebook to the airport and go and watch your airplane, uh, like I do. Uh, and they're the things that I've spent quite a while helping to design. For takeoff, we have this arrangement. The devices extend, effectively they increase the wing area, they curve very slightly. For landing, they come out and they bend down. So this is a 747 at takeoff and a 747 at landing. This is very efficient, it gives you lots of lift but very little drag. This is not so efficient in terms of drag, it creates a huge amount of drag, but that's not a problem. The aircraft's landing, you want it to stop, passengers won't get off if it doesn't stop. So drag, drag's not a problem. There might be some pilots in the audience tonight, so I'm going to say something rather controversial. controversial. Um, they do often earn their corn. This guy, you might remember the incident, certainly did. Um, back now in 2008, the British Airways Travel 7 was coming back from Moscow, I think, or flew over Siberia, and water crystals in the fuel formed into ice, blocked the fuel supply to the engines, stopped both engines running, and a Travel 7 with Several hundred people on board became a glider on the approach to Heathrow. Um, if you'd maintained the aircraft in the landing configuration, you would have crashed. As it is, you can see this is the perimeter road around Heathrow. That's where he touched down. He just about made it. And the reason he did that, counterintuitively to most of us, is that he put it into the takeoff configuration, which is the most efficient configuration the best glider it could be. Treble 7 is not a good glider at the best of times, but this was the way he got there. That's the end of that runway. That's where he touched down. This is Hounslow in West London. If he'd been 100 metres earlier, who knows what would have happened. So my hat off to him. He made the right choice at the right time. <coughs> that was the aircraft afterwards. Um, I think the only injury, in, injury sustained was someone broke a leg there. That's the top of the main undercarriage strut. Um, it shouldn't be there. <laughs> if I was in this seat here, the least I would need is a clean pair of trousers or something. <laughs> we don't just use high lift devices on airplanes, we use them on cars. Some of one cars have them at the front, the back, and underneath. High performance sailboats have them. This is America's Cup. Is this two years ago when Ben Ainsley took over and completely whitewashed the theory? Um, German touring car. A normal yacht. These are multi element aerofoils, they're high lift devices that use exactly the same principle. On one car, for example, you may not see it, but you might see the back end of it. The diffuser at the back <coughs> acts like an aerofoil. So the main body of the, air, of the um, racing car acts like a wing on an aeroplane. So it's not just the front and rear wings, it's the underside of the car, accelerates the air, drops the pressure, and sucks the car down onto the ground, which means it can go around the Talk to you now a bit about something called boundary layers. Um, boundary layers exist because of friction. When you rub your hand over any surface, if you rub a hand, you can feel heat because of friction. Air generates friction in just the same way, and we live in a boundary layer because the ground, the buildings, the trees all slow the air down. A boundary layer 
is the region of air that is slowed down by friction or by things around it. So out here, the air is, if the air is moving, this is what the speed of the air is, is moving at. It gets progressively slower and slower and slower until notionally it stops at the surface at different times. So that's a boundary layer. There are two types of boundary layer. Most of them start off with what we call laminar, which is smooth. There's no lumps in it. It's all nice and general. But if you've got roughness, like trees, it adds turbulence, and the smooth boundary layer becomes lumpy. You call it turbulent. The laminar boundary layer is smooth, the turbulent boundary layer is lumpy. If you were to take an instantaneous snapshot of the air in a boundary layer, a laminar boundary layer would look like that. All the particles going in the same direction. Turbulent boundary layer, though, is chaotic. There's particles going up, down, left, right, all over the place. So it has higher drag, but it has one distinct advantage. Because it can entrain high energy air from outside the boundary layer, to the surface. Here there is no energy transfer across the boundary layer, but there is here. And that's useful because that extra energy means that the air can be persuaded to do things it doesn't otherwise want to do. The sphere at the top here has a laminar boundary layer. It's nice, smooth, and it comes away from that sphere at about the azimuth. So this is wake turbulent wake, which causes lots of drag. Here we've put a wire across the sphere, which turns the boundary layer from laminar to turbulent. And the turbulent boundary layer, because it has more energy, doesn't separate until about here. So this wake is much smaller than this wake. The turbulent boundary layer on a sphere is a good thing if you want to reduce drag. It's also a good thing if you're a golfer. Because that's why golf balls have dimples. Because the dimples cause turbulence, the turbulent boundary layer sticks to the golf ball longer, and the wake is smaller than if there weren't any dimples. There are lots of dimples around it because it doesn't matter what direction the ball is travelling in, you'll still get the same effect. Um, even if you play golf as badly as I do and slice the ball every time you hit it, it doesn't matter. These dimples will still work. So, we've done high lift devices, we've done boundary layers, we've done a bit about vorticity, which is a bit like the stuff that comes out, or goes down in the plug hole when you let the plug out of the bath. That's a vortex. Aircraft generating <coughs> two, because the effect of generating lift on a wing is to shed a vortex at the tip. You can often see them. This is a fantastic picture of the 747. You'll note there's one vortex from each wing tip. This is a four engined aeroplane shedding condensation trails from each engine. So there are four condensation trails. But both of these ones get wrapped up into the same vortex and the same one here. So it doesn't matter how many engines the aircraft has, there will only be two condensation trails behind there. They happen all over the place. On humid days, you can see them off the rear wing of a Formula 1 car. I think that's an armored tower, isn't it? Um, this is a crop dusting aircraft, so it's very low. Um, Concorde relied on vortices on the leading edges to create lift when it landed and took off. And here on a humid day with a BC-10, you can see a, a vortex at the wingtip, a vortex on the edge of the flap, there's a vortex on the end of the tail plane. They're all over the place. What you don't want to do is fly one through these. I've only ever been in an aircraft once where I got hit by a vortex. It was a real slap. You can hear it physically. It's rather nasty. On this aircraft, the F-18, this chime here created a vortex, and it burst continually here, right in front of the tailplane. So this is unsteady, and the tailplane does that. If you bend a piece of metal long enough, it will snap, and these snapped. So we came up with a device you put in front of the tailplane that stops that vortex bursting and stops the tails coming off, and that helps the pilots stay alive. They hang around for an awful long time. Um, mentioned A380 earlier, one of the things we were doing on the A380 was trying to reduce these vortices hanging around. The Americans didn't like the A380 and were threatening to put a new classification of aircraft onto it. Some of you may know that the distance behind an aircraft <coughs> that another aircraft can land is determined by the size of both those aircraft. So a big aircraft landing behind a small aircraft is reasonably okay. 
the small aircraft landing behind a big aircraft is not. The separation distance is huge. The Americans were threatening to put the Ace 80 into a whole new category that meant it would be twice as far back as any other airplane, which therefore negated the fact that it got two decks and carried twice as many people. No one protection is a no-do. But these are nasty. These have caused crashes, and so we need to understand that. We can reduce the effects of vorticity by making the vortex as far away from the aircraft as possible. We can reduce the effect of induced drag. And that's why gliders have a very high aspect ratio, very long, thin wing. We get that vortex as far away as possible. You might also see winglets on here. There are a variety of different winglets. Boeing tend to favor these shark clip type things, whereas Airbus have little TIE fighter type end wings on them. Um, they don't change the amount of vorticity, they just change the way that it's shed. So that the net result is that those vortices don't hang around as long as they would without them. These ones, over by Boeing, also increase the wingspan slightly, which as you know, without actually increasing the wingspan of the aircraft. The other thing you might have noticed, if you're observant, is little ears appearing on engine that's off. These were invented by Guy Douglas, um, which became Boeing property when Boeing bought McDonnell Douglas. Um, Airbus <coughs> used them knowingly in breach of patent control. Right? Because the fine they pay for breaching the patent is less than the advantage they get from the work. What the little straight does is it generates a vortex. You can see the vortex here coming over the wing on a humid day. The wing humidity app is coming over this aircraft here. You can see from this picture that this junction here, there's lots of different pieces of geometry. It's a nasty, turbulent piece of air. And on a good wing design, this dirty air coming across the top will cause the aircraft to stall prematurely. This little vortex sits above that point, squashes all that nasty, dirty air, and stops the aircraft stalling at that point. Really well tried. But vortices can be bad too. Um, this is another Thunderbird aircraft. This is the Valkyrie, the XB-70. A bomber flew at three times the speed of sound, Mark III. It was designed um, to carry nuclear weapons. And the Russians created a fighter just to catch this aeroplane. It had six engines in a pod underneath. These wingtips bent down in flight to create what's called a wave rider. So it sat on top of the shock brake. It took part in a publicity shop for General Electric. General Electric made the engines for each of these different types of aircraft, the Starfighter, the Phantom, an F-5, and of course the Valkyrie. The Starfighter here, um, either the pilot forgot or was unaware of what vortices can do to an aeroplane. So you can see that's the Starfighter and what's left of it. The Valkyrie is minus both of its vertical tails. Starfighter got too close to the wingtip, got caught in the vortex, and was thrown across the top of the aircraft, taking these two, two tails with it on the way past. Unfortunately, the guy in Starfighter died instantly. Um, the tails are there for a reason, they keep the aircraft stable. But without them, the aircraft became unstable and started to tumble. This is the aircraft on its back. The aircraft is going in this direction. You can see the fuel coming out of the wing here. Um, the aircrew had a special capsulized ejection system because it was going at Mark III you can't just put your hand out the window it was a bit drafty so to eject they had a capsule system with clamshell doors that came down and closed the pilot and the co-pilot and then ejected unfortunately the g-forces were so great that one of the seats failed to operate properly the other one came down but the pilot's arm was outside of the capsule when it closed Sustained rather bad arm injuries, but was flying six months later. Unfortunately, the other test pilot and the pilot of the Starfighter were killed. It just shows you what happens if you don't understand the physics. <coughs> Shock waves. Supersonic flow. Air that goes faster than the speed of sound. Um, I want to talk you through these pictures, if I may, briefly. 
Top left, if you imagine dropping a stone into a pool of water, you get a ripple effect. The same, same happens with a sound source. If you create a signal, a wave emanates from that signal at the speed of sound. If we do it periodically, so we have one, two, three of these waves starting at equal time intervals, they will expand in circle. If we take that pool in a pond analogy and turn that into a stone in a stream, so that we drop a stone into a moving piece of water, we have to add speed of the water to the speed of the ripple. So the ripples on one side will be expanded, the ripples on the other side will be condensed. If you hear an ambulance or a police car go by, you get that sound shift, Doppler effect. And this is the reason why. Behind it, you see this frequency. In front of it, you'll see this frequency. And they're different, so the sound will be different. It's how we can tell whether planets are moving away from us or coming towards us, depending on whether they've got the blue or the red shift. Dave, don't ask me which one's which. <laughs> so this is slower than the speed of sound. If our stream of water or air is moving at the speed of sound, we still get this elongation effect behind the ripple, but it's exacerbated. The waves coming this way, though, are moving at the same speed as the air or the water is going that way. So they remain stationary to an observer. But all of these lines pile up on top of each other. Each individual wave stays where it is. The next one reinforces the one before, and so on. So what you get is a very spread out frequency here. And you get everything happening at once at the front. And that's a shock wave. It's a very sudden rise in pressure or temperature, probably both. If you go faster than the speed of sound, the waves cannot go forward at all. They are all swept backwards. So the first one swept downstream, the next one behind it, and then behind. So this is where the source originated from. Instead of a wave front like this, you get an envelope, a wedge-shaped envelope. An observer, if this was sound, an observer here would hear nothing because sound cannot travel past that drop wave. Same as here. Anything outside of this wave front will not hear anything. Here, you'll hear it, and here you'll get everything at once. There's a shock wave. Will we follow that? I'll go through it again at the end if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're quite interesting things. Um, this is a... Uh, I think it is. So there's the envelope of, of waves there. Again, because you get a sudden drop in pressure, the water can condense out of the, water, of the air, and you get a cloud. This is a volcano erupting, and you can see the eruption created a shock wave, which moves the clouds out of the way. And this is a USS battleship firing its guns, and you can see from each of the guns it's created a circular shock wave. I'm just going to play you a short video, and I'm going to try and stop it before the swearing happens. <laughs> this is a volcanic eruption. Watch out for the shock, it's coming. interesting phenomena um, and they need controlling because they can do nasty things. You don't have to be going supersonic to get shockwaves. As I mentioned before, an aerofoil is designed to accelerate air around it. So even if the aircraft isn't supersonic, the air accelerated around it might be. And what you get is a shockwave forming on top of the wing first and then you'll get another one on the bottom. 
not mirror image because this air is not going as fast as this. Disadvantage of this is these cause an awful lot of drag. And in the nicest circumstances, we talked about boundary layers earlier on, a shockwave's foot in a boundary layer can rip it off the surface. So you get a huge weight, a bit like off a golf ball. And so if a shock forms on a wing, you get a huge amount of drag. And they're not always steady, they can move backwards and forwards, you get something called shock buffet, your whole aircraft starts to vibrate. This is the sort of picture that I, as a migraine sufferer, hate looking at for too long. It's a nasty pattern. Um, but you can see the shock wave here. It's one coming off the canopy and one off the intake. And this is what Paul Schleer in the picture is um, using mirrors to measure density in a wind tunnel. You can see the shock pattern here is very similar to the one here. And you can see here the way that the boundary layer has been ripped off the top of the wing. Huge wake, lots of drag. But as aerodynamicists, we've come up with ways of cheating air. One of them is to sweep the wings back. If it's the acceleration around the wing that causes the shock wave, we can delude the air into thinking that we've got a thinner wing than we actually have. If we sweep this wing, the distance from the front here to the back, if we measure it normal to the edge, is the same as that. It's the same depth of wing. What we've done is sweep it back. The air, being dim stuff, thinks now that it's actually a longer path to go. So the effective thickness here, it's got the same thickness, but it's longer. But the ratio of the thickness to the length is smaller. And that delays the formation of the shock on the wing. That's why you'll see most airliners, most high-speed aircraft have swept wings, to delay that shock formation. Um, the UK was quite late coming to high-speed aerodynamics. There are two major com components of high-speed aerodynamics before the war, Second World War. A guy called Prantl, who we mentioned before at Göttingen, and a guy called Blau, based down at Farnborough. He um, was looking at supersonic airflow in the 1920s, when aircraft could barely manage more than 150 miles an hour. So he was a bit of a maverick. Um, unfortunately, he was taking a walk at Farnborough, and they were dynamiting some trees to make way for an extension to the runway. And the workman had used far too much dynamite and was hit by a flying tree stem. Mm. That meant that the Germans had a head start in terms of high speed aerodynamics when the war started. And that's why the Germans were much quicker at adopting the swept wing and the jet engine than we were. Another device we use is something called a supercritical airfoil. You may remember this is the kind of picture I showed you just now a very strong shock sitting on top of the wing rip the boundary layer off. If we change the shape so that there's less acceleration at the front, the air doesn't become sonic until much later. We've got a funny hook shape here to make up for the loss of lift at the front. But what we get is a relatively weak shock at the back. It's got a very different distribution of pressure along it. We've not much pressure at the front, sorry, a lot of pressure at the front, not much at the back, and vice versa here. But by having this relatively weak shock, the increase in drag is much delayed. It was first used on the Handy Page Victor. It formed the basis of the AS300 wing design and is now on every airline in all flying. This is the sort of picture that gets stewardesses telling you off. Um, two aeronautists taking pictures and pointing at a wing apparently unsettles the rest of the passengers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you probably can't see it on this picture, but there is a white line down here. It's this shock. Um, when the sun is in the right angle, the sun shines directly onto the shock plate, and you get the shadow in front and a rarefied air behi area behind it, so you get a brighter patch. So this is that shock sitting on the wing. This is an A320 flying the cruise at 32,000 feet. I've only ever seen it this once, which is why I got excited and told off. But it's there all the time, but most people don't realise it. So, here there, a bit about aircraft design. Um, this next bit really pains me because as an experimentalist, I hate talking about computers. But I'm going to have to. Um, I mentioned the Navier Stokes equations right at the beginning, and I'm sure you remember them well. Um, as I said, they <laughs> define the motion of air. So, in the computer, if we can create 
a virtual wing and a virtual space of air around it. If we discretize that space into all these nodes, we can solve the equations of motion at each of these points. And if we do that, we can sum up the effects and work out the performance of that wing. It's called computational fluid dynamics, CFD. And it is a relatively low cost and effective way of doing lots of preliminary design. But this is an example of the results we get, just looking at velocity. This is the aerofoil here, two dimensions. The air is accelerated over the top, less so at the bottom. We've got quantifiable numbers here. And we know how well the wing is doing. We can close in and get really fine detail. We can get pressure gradients, so we can look at whether there's shock waves or not, whether the flow is separated. And we can turn it into much more complex geometry, something that looks like a real aeroplane. This is three dimensional, it's a, a wing, a flap, and a slat attached to a fuselage. And see the fineness of the detail we go to. But there are millions of nodes at which we have to solve the equations of motion. But this art has become more prevalent the more powerful computers have become. We can now do calculations like this on a laptop. When I first started working, we had computers which took up rooms to do this sort of stuff. So the advances are incredible. A relevant example from my own experience, this is the Airbus A380. So this is the leading edge of the A380, the slats at the front and the flaps at the back. You can see here that nasty flow that's coming from the nacelle. And that's why we put the strake on the nacelle to create that vortex that kills all that and helps the wing work. So this is my wind tunnel, the 5 meter wind tunnel, with the A380 model in it. We put paint on the flap to see where the air went, took a picture, this one here, and compared it with the results from the computer. You can see the computer's not done a bad job. This is the point where the air decides it doesn't want to be on the flap anymore and comes away from the surface. It's what we call a separation point. And in the wind tunnel, we've got this line here, which is the actual separation point. So the computer's not had a bad go at it. For high-speed aerodynamics, the computer, it, done, it does about 95% really well. For low speed like this, and for this kind of reason, this disparity only does about 50% really well. You still use the wind tunnel. I still see, probably will always see, calculations done on things that can't possibly be right. Um, the experimentalists among us have coins serve to be the colour for directors. It's good for making pictures to impress <coughs> us. Um, that's Bloodhound, that's a Dasso business jet, that's a Formula One car. I don't believe any of those pictures. Geometry is too complex, the flow structures are too complex, but they are very pretty. <laughs> Why do we do this? One is to make faster, more fuel efficient, larger aeroplane. This is 707 in 1954. Slightly unfair picture. This is using water injection. Um, it looks like it's got a stoker on board shoveling coal into the A350. <laughs> um, that's the A350. Which was the latest Airbus aircraft. Um, there's no smoke coming out of that here. So, what have we done in that intermediate time? Well, this is a graph showing the improvement in the fuel used per seat kilometre. So for every kilometre that one person goes on an airliner, starting at 100% at the Comet 4. So this is 1947-48. We start up here. Down here, so this is still, that's 350 there, I think. Um, this is quite optimistic. But you can see the amount of fuel used has gone down by over 70%. We use 30% of the fuel we used to use to take you one kilometre. It's quite impressive. Good for the environment. It means your seat ticket comes down in price as well because they're not chucking as much fuel out the back. And they're quiet at all. Again, this is a relative graph. At the top here, we've got the 1950s. There's Comet again, there's VC10. And the scale on the left is in decibels, and it's um, perceived noise. Um, there's lots of ways of measuring sound. Perceived noise is the one that you and I should care most about because it's what the human ear perceives as being sound. It's not the actual sound, it's what we hear. 
The perceived noise is important, and especially if you live near an airport. It's a log scale, <coughs> which means that change of 10 dB is a factor of 100 in noise. So from 707 to 707, it's a thousand times quieter in terms of perceived noise, which is good, certainly if you live near an airport. I haven't heard anything like Bernie Eccleston saying that aircraft need to be noisy. Quite impressive change. So lastly, nearly there, chaps. All in one car does use wings to generate downforce. As I mentioned earlier, it's the diffuser that causes most of it. The front, front and rear wings are used to balance the car out. Lots of front wing downforce makes the car oversteer, understeer, understeer. <coughs> More downforce at the back because it's over. So, front and rear wing contribute about the same. The rest of the body works 10%. The underbody of the fuser, about 40%. I want to show you quickly a study of improving a rear wing, how we design analysis design it. So, this is a multi element rear wing. It's this bit off the back of a racing car. What we've done is some CFD as before. And we've worked out where the flow separates off the flap. This is where the air comes away from the surface and causes a big turbulent leak. What we want to do is reduce the amount of separation because we think that will improve the downforce. As an aside, I had an HND student on Monday in our wind tunnel down the road do a nice little test on a Mercedes touring car. And you can see this is the separation line. We painted it with yellow paint. And we saw where the air came off. It matches quite nicely to that. If we can get the computer to push and pull geometry, we can automatically assess different configurations. So the computer will go away, it will stretch, it will pull, it will move, it will twist. And it comes back with these results. This is downforce. And you can see it's searching for the best solution. And this is the best it got. Unfortunately, our criteria for low separation is here. So we've chosen the wrong criteria because with more separation than we had planned, we got more downforce. So this was the best design according to our criteria, but this was the best design that gave us the most downforce. We've got lots of tools at our disposal, but we have to use them correctly. And these are the two different shapes that came up. Not just individual parts of the car we design for now. For a Formula One car, for example, we want to look at minimizing the lap time. So we're not designing for cornering, we're not designing for high speed, we're looking for the whole lap. So we can assess the car all the way around the circuit, do thousands of calculations, and work out which is the best combination of front wing, rear wing, diffuser, suspension settings, and come up with a minimum lap time. And that's really powerful because we can look at lots and lots of parameters. We've got coefficient of friction here, that's the tyres, mass, power, lift coefficient, lift to drag coefficient. And it's clear from a graph like this that the thing that gives you the greatest cornering is the tyre. Not unsurprising. But because we can see the design sensitivities here, we know where to put our money, improving the tyre. Front wings are curious because they're not all about downforce. You can see from, that's Mercedes, isn't it? Um, all these strokes are pointing at the front tire. So we manage the air around the front tire. All these end plates, all these strips here, are pointing the air to go over the front wing. Two years ago, that was because the tires kept exploding, they were getting too hot. By putting air across the top, it kept them cool. But it also reduces the drag. The rear wing, works in conjunction with the diffuser. So you've got the rear wing here, lower wing, and diffuser. And they work exactly the same way that an aircraft tire lift system works. Each element works in conjunction with the other and creates a lot of downforce. It's amusing to see modern road cars. A lot of them have a kind of plastic diffuser at the back. It might be 18 inches off the ground, but it's still on there as a styling gimmick. It does nothing whatsoever here. So to finish. Hooray.
<laughs> Aerodynamics design. Um, we'll talk about aircraft design, we'll talk about racing car design. I'd like to explain two differences. With aircraft, you're managing the air on the surface of the aircraft, looking at pressures on the, on the skin of the aircraft. With a racing car, we're managing the air around it, we're looking at vortices off the wings and where they go. So they go under the car, over the wheel. So it's what's around the car, not what's on it. And the really big difference is time scale. I spent 15 years working on the A380 from the concept to first flight. Um, if you spend more than 15 days working on an F1 project, that's a long time. It's not as technical, but it's a lot more immediate and in some ways more rewarding. Thank you very much. The air moving along on a swept wing, the air will move along the wing as well as over it. I should have brought a modern aeroplane, I can pretend to be an aeroplane. <laughs> the wing fence will sit there and it stops the air going in that direction. Um, it's used uh, many times to stop the, the air separating at the tip because tip stall is nasty because that causes lots of free rolling moments and it's difficult to control. So, wing fence um, is used to stop the air moving in one direction, but not to cause vorticity. If you look at things like dog teeth, if you look at the leading edge of a wing, it's got a sawtooth in it, that's a vortex generator. But a wing fence isn't, that does something different. Any other questions? Um, Michael, you said you were using your own. When you're optimising your airfoil or whatever it is that's keeping things in the air or down on the ground, you're doing some sort of search for a minimum or a maximum, aren't you? And many searches for minima converge on one of what could be many minima. It's a general statement I may be, and I notice you agree. How, how confident are we that this is the minimum that we should be looking for? I assume that after 100 years we know that this is the minimum that really matters. It's, it's a good question, and it's the bugbear of all optimization routines. We, we use gradient-based search methods. The trick is <coughs> setting the constraints that the optimization works within so that it will ignore stupid answers. Um, it won't go down rabbit holes. Um, but fortunately, it still needs human intervention to say that that's physically not a good idea. Um, the flip side of that is that the process has no preconceptions. It will investigate things that an aerodynamicist might not investigate because he thinks that's a stupid thing to go and look at. So it will explore the whole of the design space and not care one hoop whether it's a good thing to do or not. So you can come up with some interesting solutions. Uh, that's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. One, one final question. Uh, you talk about the vortices and also the shock waves. And there's a lot about weather forecasting at the moment and chaos theory. And you know, it, it does seem quite a nice predictability. Um, how is that factored in in terms of you know, the, the kind of weather? Because it's not just a straight airflow, is it? It might get unpredictability. Mm -hmm. um, the weather patterns you see on the evening news will be created through computational fluid dynamics. Um, and they don't have perfect understanding of the physics. In the same way, the lot of CFD that we do as aircraft designers doesn't have to understand. Um, 
they are subject to vagaries that aren't included within the model. Um, they're getting better and better and better, but they're still not perfect. Um, chaos theory is interesting because it has been applied to areas where we don't fully understand the physics, because if you do things chaotically, you might inadvertently get the right answer. And so one of the things that we don't understand is with permanent boundary layers, they are very chaotic. And if they're chaotic, why not apply chaos theory to it? So there is a, a branch there that, again, it's, it's understanding what's physical and what's not, because you'll come up with some wacky answers. And you still need the human brain to intercede to say, yes, that's, that's right, that's wrong. If it's right, why was it right? If it's wrong, why was it wrong? So it's that, that almost like an intelligent algorithm, learning from what goes right and what goes wrong. I'm, I'm going to ask the principal of the college now just to just say a few words and a vote of thanks, and then we've got one final short thing just after that. Mark. Hi. Thank you, Colin. Um, hi, I'm Margaret Monson. I'm the principal on Tuesday Tech of Prep College UHI, and I'm here to propose a vote of thanks mainly to our speaker tonight, Professor Andrew Ray. Andrew and I have um, had many conversations um, about Please join us afterwards for some refreshments. But we've got one final but really important thing, and that is that uh, professors are really important to the lifeblood of the university. And when you have a new professor, you want to welcome him to the professoriate. So tonight we're asking Professor Mark Fax to welcome Andrew Ray to the professoriate. Mark. Right. Well, I would also like to thank, start by thanking Andrew for his lecture because I really didn't like physics and I I did discover it was useful later in my career when I found uses for it, but there were all these um, formulae that I really hated. So he's truly shown us one aspect of being a professor, which is the leading expert on your subject in the <coughs> university. I don't think anyone could uh, say anything else. And the title of professor has long been recognized as the highest rank in academia. Professors are expected to demonstrate high competence in their area of scholarship, and they have intellectual skills typically associated with active research and an international profile reflecting high academic esteem and reputation. I'm going to leave the next bit out because dinner is calling. <laughs> what do professors do? Well, what, if you see us, what do we do? They often manage people working in their subject area, they conduct advanced research, much of which will be published but not always, and they supervise and mentor postgraduate students and many of us also teach. 
and as well, we play active roles within our university and act as ambassadors for it. Sometimes we both have been to China. Um, we represent it in the wider context, locally, nationally, internationally. And I don't know about him, but I think most of us also work for free for the communities in which we're based, whether it's communities of place or communities of interest, such as professional organizations. So we try to be aspirational role models for progressing, progressing academics and peers at all levels. So that's the general things that we are meant to do. And I just will go back to this last one, which was, I did a little bit of background reading. There was a survey of UK professors published in 2011. And when they were asked what was the most important thing a professor did, the unanimous thing was to help other colleagues to develop provide leadership in research to be a role model and uphold standards of scholarship. The lowest ones that they recognized, only half of them recognized as an important characteristic was income generation. <laughs> That's not always what my bosses say. However, back to the University of the Highlands and Islands. Um, one thing that Clive didn't say is it is the newest university in the UK and may, may still be the newest university in the world. It's only four years old. But for more than a decade, the court of the university has had the power to grant professorships and we have many professors uh, who specialize in diabetes research, Nordic studies, archeology, span history, digital health, marine science, and more, to which we can now add engineering. And uh, I got my professorship just a, a nearly 10 years ago in Mountain Studies. Um, I'm based here, and my experience in this role has brought a lot of responsibilities, but also challenges and pleasures. The next one being that I have a doctoral student who will defend his thesis on Thursday, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed, although I'm sure he'll get through. I'm sure that Andrew will find his new role hugely in rewarding, and I would like you to join me in welcoming him to the professorate of the University of the Highlands of Ireland.